Hello, I'm Matthew Thibault from the Education University of Hong Kong, and today we're going to talk about Play Along Technology, Miles Davis's song So What, and the invention of the beginning jazz improvisation student. Uh, how do those go together? What is a play along? What is Miles Davis's So What? And how did they together help contribute to the invention of the beginning jazz improvisation student? Let's dive right in. Here's a beginning improvisation student. One, two, one, two, three, four. And she's playing along with the recording. And she's creating. And she's playing along with a play-along. A play-along is a book and a sound recording that give you structure and support for learning jazz. And we're going to talk about those today. But before we go any further, I want to understand Helen's perspective. And then when I asked her to reflect on this uh, improvisation, she said that during her life, she loved listening to jazz and she always wanted to improvise. But in the past, she thought it was an impossible task for her to improvise because she was raised with classical music and reading the score. Now, she took a class with me, and after the experiences, she felt amazed and proud of herself that she has the ability um, and that she can play with different play-along recordings. And she said, every time I record and hear my improvisation, I still cannot believe that I can improvise a new idea. And here, you can see at the end, improvising music really gives me a great sense of fulfillment. So there's a beginning improvisation student, someone who didn't think they could improvise, but they could play music, but they learned to have a sense of fulfillment. And the play-along recording that she's working with is a very important part of that, in my understanding. Now, today what I'm talking about comes from a 24-month study that was funded by the Education University here. You can see the research team. There's Sharon, Malo, myself, and Chang, and we're holding one of a, those play-along recordings. The study was built on an oral history. We interviewed the people, including Mr. Abersold, who helped to create the modern version of the play-along. I coded those interviews using deduce software. Um, I also engaged in documentary analysis of play-along volumes and correspondence and other materials, uh, the historic, history of jazz uh, education. I observed two summers of Abersold's summer jazz workshop, and the framework ha comes from sound studies and the philosophy of technology. So the framework is that teachers and students together create these new patterns of engagement using these technologies. And jazz learning became mediated. Now that study is currently under review. With our limited time today, I'm just going to talk about how the play-along was a key technology for inventing the beginning improvisation student. Now we already heard Helen play, but let's back up and hear some serious jazz. This is 1959, John Coltrane, playing a saxophone solo with Miles Davis. And I've put some uh, things for you to think about on the side. It's about a half a minute. It sounds wonderful, but it's also very complicated, and you can imagine that if you were a musician then, you wouldn't know how to get there. We do now know, uh, in part through Paul Berliner's work, his ethnography of jazz learning, that jazz musicians learned in a variety of ways. They were often self-directed, and they were interested. Uh, 
They often had an apprenticeship. They might have had formal lessons. And they often went to jam sessions with other musicians or played in big bands. And they listened to lots of recordings. They studied recordings the way that classical musicians study scores. So we know something about that. But the question back then was, <clears throat> how could we get students into jazz? How could we just take a classroom full of people who might not be interested and still get them to learn to be jazz musicians? And this brings to mind, a, it's a curricular question. First off, what is a jazz musician? You know, what does doing jazz consist of and how is it different from the classical music we often offer? And second, how can teachers teach others to be creative jazz musicians? And in 1959, when Coltrane was playing, there were a lot of challenges. There was an opposition to improvisation in universities. There were cultural and racial biases against jazz. They even called it the jazz problem. Teachers said, how do I keep my students from their interest in jazz? That was in the 1920s, but up through the 1960s. And there's still some improvisational uh, uh, opposition and some bias. Some of it is racial. Some of it is cultural. Number three, conservatories worked with notation, but jazz also uses recordings and is spontaneously created. So they didn't know how to work with that or serve that uh, need. Number four, the conservatory divided performers and composers, but jazz unites them. So it was a different conception. And there wasn't an agreed upon method for teaching jazz, even though jazz education goes all the way back to 1900. And finally, there wasn't an overall theory of jazz harmony. The, the harmonies of jazz were different, and they didn't know exactly how. Despite that, from 1960 to 1970, the number of jazz bands in American colleges grew from 30 in 1960 to 450 in 1970. How and why? Well, back in 1960 just entering university was Jamie Abersold. There he is playing the banjo. He had been born in 1939 in New Albany, Indiana, and he was raised with music. He played piano, banjo, and saxophone. He taught himself to play jazz by ear, by listening all the time. And then he went to college at Indiana University, which turned out to be a very good choice. Uh, but even in high school, he created for himself a play-along, a practice tape. Here he is describing it from our interview. And I made a couple of basic play-along tracks, the blues, and I think I did a Coltrane tune and maybe something else. And each one of them were about five minutes apiece. And I took that tape and the recorder to college with me. And I would take that, lug that up to my practice room out of my locker and practice with that. So he had a reel-to-reel -reel tape player, and he made a play-along on his parents' organ that he could play along with with his saxophone. So he already was understanding this idea, although there weren't a lot of play-alongs available then. And then, when he was in Indiana, he had a key lesson with David Baker. And when he sat down to play with him, Baker told him that they could use different scales for different chords and that that was one way to understand jazz. And he taught him about the Dorian mode, which is almost like a minor mode, but it has a raised sixth. You do, 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 do. And he said that you could use that mode as a good scale for minor chords. And Abersold was really excited about this idea. And then later on, he took another lesson, and he left that lesson and said to myself, I'm going to devote myself to studying chords and scales. And then he realized, because he was learning this way, this organized way of learning chords and learning scales, it could be used in teaching. And the next year, when he started teaching private lessons, he had an idea one day to experiment teaching improvisation. And here's what happened. The Miles Davis record, Kind of Blue, had come out. One day, I had a flute student who was the daughter of the local doctor. So she started playing, and I'm walking the bass line in the left hand and playing cards in the right hand. I can instantly hear that what she's playing is coming straight from her mind, and she's playing two and four bar phrases. And it's just like she would be singing with her mouth. 
So I quickly found out that by trying with other students that if I told them what the scale was in advance and they practiced the scale up and down, that they could play. So that was the first time that Abersold taught improvisation, and he realized that even if someone wasn't devoted to jazz, that they could still do this in some way. They could improvise. And it was no accident that he used So What? You can see here the cover of the album, Kind of Blue. When we heard Coltrane improvise earlier, he was improvising over So What? And the form or the structure of this song is very simple. It uses the D Dorian mode for the first eight measures. It repeats those eight measures with D Dorian again. And then it rises up chromatically a half step to E flat Dorian. And you can see the scales down at the bottom. And you can see the dark notes are uh, the chord tones that would be used. And so the whole song is just built on those two modes. It has a very modern sound, a very fresh sound because of the Dorian mode. But it had a very relaxed tempo that was good for beginners. And it was still satisfying for an expert like Coltrane. And people still think about using that. It's often the first song that people learn. Here's a Twitter a uh, tweet from Ethan Hine, who's an educator in New York. It says, beginning level improvisation exercise. This is how easily you can present this tune. Play the white keys until it starts sounding wrong, then switch to the black keys. When that starts sounding wrong, switch back to the white keys. The song is that easy to teach, even if someone doesn't know anything other than how to tell apart white and black keys. You can give them a chance to try it. And one of the reasons it's so easy is it is what we call modal jazz. At that time, a lot of bebop was very complex in its forms and in its chords and harmonies. But Davis uh, had a different idea. And you can see two uh, statements here. The first one, I think a movement in jazz is beginning away from the string of chords. There will be fewer chords but infinite possibilities. Of course, that sounds great for a beginning teacher. Infinite possibilities and fewer chords. And then it says, when you go on this way, you can go on forever. You don't have to worry about changes, which means chord changes, and you can do more with the line. It becomes a challenge to see how inventive you are. Well, let's listen to Miles Davis. Here's uh, one chorus of him going through the form. D Dorian twice, E flat Dorian, and back down. Listen, hear how he uses space, and hear how the sound is really beautiful and very simple. Uh, there's a five bar introduction before the first D. They're finishing the melody, which is interestingly played by the bass. Here it is two, three, four, go. the Dorian tonality. Here comes E flat. And if you haven't spent time listening to that song, it's a great first song to learn. Um, now, there's something really interesting that I uncovered in my research, and that has to do with this uh, musician, George Russell. And George Russell was the first person to really articulate a music theory of modal jazz. And he actually had talked to Miles Davis and inspired him and said, oh, you should try composing using jazz modes, using these old modes, Greek modes, and building jazz on top of that. And he hired Miles Davis, he hired John Coltrane, and he was a musician who worked with them. But he was also a teacher, 
and in 1953 he published a book called The Lydian Chromatic Concept, where he spelled out that idea. And in 1959 he revised it, and he taught at the Lennox School of Jazz in Massachusetts, and one of his students was David Baker. So if you were going to do some conspiracy theory, you would note the fascinating coincidence that the same man, George Russell, inspired Miles Davis to write So What? And years later, he taught David Baker how to think about jazz in that way. So when Jamie Abersold taught his flute student to use So What? to improvise, he was using ideas that he got from David Baker, who got them from George Russell, just as Miles Davis had been inspired to compose that piece by George Russell. So there was a natural and organic connection between the pedagogy and the music itself. Now, Abersold took those ideas. He began teaching in a summer jazz camp, and then he had the idea to make his own play-along, which he published in 1967, and the first song is very similar to So What? It was built on the E-flat and D minor Dorian scales and also the F Dorian scale to make it a little bit different. But it's clearly inspired by So What? One, Here's two, how it sounds. Three, four. And you can imagine creating on top of this. It's just chords and the rhythm section so that you can create things on top of it. And he gave examples and then he invited improvisations. So this was the first play-along, and you can see then, you know, my topic is how did the play-along and so what help to create the beginning jazz student? So let's go back to these questions I asked. What is a jazz musician? What does doing jazz consist of? And how can teachers teach it? It should be clear by now, uh, I'm going to give you some of the summary from my paper, that uh, I talk about how Jamie Abersold, David Baker, and another uh, teacher, Jerry Coker, invented the soloist as such between 1955 and 1990. They created a model. So if somebody wanted to teach jazz, they had to know, well, what is jazz and how will we teach it? There's many ways to do it, but their way ended up being very, very influential. In fact, you can see number one, people talk about the ABCs of jazz, and they mean Abersold, Baker, and Coker, and later Dan Hurley and Rufus Reed. But So these three men uh, helped to create this idea of what a jazz student would be. And number two, they said students would learn the chords that were used in jazz. Number three, they would learn the scales that can be used with those chords, like the Dorian scale. Number four, students would practice patterns and licks that work for them. So they might learn, you know, do, do, do. They might learn the minor triad, or they might learn a do, you, do, da, kind of a blues scale. And they would also listen to recordings and get scales and patterns from those. In fact, that's where they got their scales and patterns. Number five, they would think about tunes in terms of chords and scales. And then they would do all of this and learn all of this through practicing with the play-along. So how was the play-along a key technology for inventing the beginning improvisation student? All right, so then the answer to the question, what is a jazz musician doing? There's lots of ways to answer that, but the early jazz educators who created play-alongs like Jamie Abersold and the people he was working with at the Summer Jazz Workshop they had this answer. They would say a jazz musician learns chords and scales to fuel their imagination. And they learn to hear things and to play them and to be inventive while listening to the other members. And the answer of how someone could teach that or how someone could learn that was lots of practice. And the practice aid was the technology of the play along. So if I want to... Uh, learn so what, I can get a play-along that follows that structure. One, two, this is one, from volume two, 54. Three, four. And I already can hear it, and I could play my Dorian mode. 
then I could make some ideas up. And I'm creating. And then I go to E flat. I can hear that. And in my imagination, the notes that are coming out are ones that I'm intending because I've practiced enough, you know? And I don't have to stay within the mode. I can play chromatics. I can do everything. But I've learned to ingest the basic harmonic structure by learning and playing the chords and by listening. And on and on it would go. So that's the basic idea of what someone is doing when they are learning jazz. That's what it means to be a jazz musician, and that's how teachers and students could learn to grow in that way, was to have this conception of chords and scales and this technology of the play-along for developing their ability to be creative. So let's see another beginning adult improvisation student, just to give you one more example. Uh, my student, Helen, uh, used her guzhong to uh, practice the two five one progression, which was is a particular harmonic progression. It just sounds wonderful, you know. Uh, just as with myself, when students are learning this way, they want to keep doing it because it's it's a joy. So how did the play-along help to create the beginning improviser? Well, with a play-along, learning jazz had several features. Here's seven of them that I talk about in my paper. Number one, it was applied. Instead of just learning the theory, you learn it by playing. You learn it by doing. Number two, it was oral. The sound was more important than the score. The score was less important than being able to hear it and do it. Another way to think of it is number three, it was integrated. Learning jazz was about connecting your mind and your imagination to your ears, listening to yourself and listening to others, and the hand or the throat, the singing and the playing, the doing. And those were integrated. But it was also sequential, so that you could start with a simple song like So What or a major scale, and you could learn progressively more complicated scales, chords, and tunes. Then, number five, it was creative. You learned things by improvising. You didn't just learn by following the directions of other previous players. You learned by improvising. Number six, uh, as you heard for myself, I couldn't stop playing when I was just demonstrating because it is joyful. It's fun. Students want to learn. They want to play. And number seven, the play-along made jazz learning approachable. In fact, Abersold's slogan is anyone can improvise. Another way to think about that, if I wanted you to have one key takeaway, I would say this. The play-along domesticated jazz. It tamed it so that jazz could bring new wildness and creativity and improvisation 
to organized and formal music learning. So how could we get a group of students to do something like Coltrane? We could follow a pathway that was laid out by the play along. Anyone can improvise. You can too, and I hope your students might. Uh, this paper that I've written will likely come out uh, in the next year or two. Uh, but if you're interested before that, you can write to me and we can correspond some. But I'm very interested in how teachers learned how to teach improvisation. And uh, to close with, you can see Jamie Abersold in his teaching. He's got music can be a friend for your whole life. Another slogan over there says, written music is a crutch, which is kind of funny in a way. Up at the top, there I am with uh, Mr. Abersold. You can also see the research team. Thanks again to them. And there's Jamie Abersold playing uh, jazz with his quartet in a demonstration to young students who are being asked to listen and to imagine. I hope we all have an opportunity to do something similar. It's wonderful to imagine jazz. Thank you for your kind attention. And a copy of this presentation will be available on my personal professional website. So go to my website, look up my name, and uh, you're welcome to uh, spend some more time thinking about this. Thanks again.